Uh, Prof, we had a brief session before you came in. Yeah. And as a class, we felt that uh, it is a uh, time we celebrate mm -hmm. good things when they happen, when we still have the time. Okay. And We have lost you, or is it me who is lost? Uh, is Boaz? Yeah, yeah. We lost Boaz. <laughs> we have lost Boaz temporarily. Okay. Momentarily. Momentarily. Yes. Uh, sure he'll come back. Does, does anyone else want to continue? Uh, I think Jenny can continue, then Boaz will take over. Okay. Um, As we wait for Boaz, um, basically what uh, we felt we need to do um mm. prof is uh to extend our appreciation and congratulations to you mm. we are blessed to mm. sit mm. at your feet mm. i in my thinking i don't know whether there's any vc in this country who who takes classes i i stand to be corrected i'm not aware of any mm. but we are blessed to have you mm -hmm. Um, we are learning because it's a process. We are learning about servant leadership from you. Mm. Um, I must say there's a lecture we had on em emotional intelligence. Mm. I keep replaying um, mm. that lesson mm. because every time I listen to it, there are different things. Uh, it speaks to me. There are different mm. encounters uh, I go through and uh, the things you taught us in that lesson keep speaking to me, correcting me, encouraging me. And there are so many mm -hmm. other things that, that uh, personally I know I've learned from being one of your students. So even mm -hmm. as we go on, we don't take it for granted as your master's class. Mm -hmm. uh, there are times you, you remind us that we do not know English. Mm -hmm. That is why uh, we, <laughs> we are still learning. <laughs> and that is why we have to continue sitting at your feet and learning mm. from you. And uh, mm. basically, we just want to wish you well in this next five-year term as we walk with you. And mm. I believe as we continue, because for us, if we, to, we are to stay for the five-year term, it is because we will have finished our master's and we shall be doing our PhD. Yeah. And we will continue working with you. Thank you mm. so much. And God bless you. <laughs> and we love you. And... Uh, meet you at your point of faith and need. Okay, oh, well, wow. continue. Yeah, <laughs> yes, uh, I'll, I'll now just conclude, Prof. Uh, you guys have your ideas to the ground, eh? I, I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry what happened. I don't know what just disconnected me, but it came back. Uh, it's Prof, okay. Uh, it is, it is uh, actually a blessing uh, to mm. be a class that you as a VC interacts with more closely. Uh, despite mm -hmm. uh, us being uh, in far off places, we still feel like we're actually in the same place. Anytime mm -hmm. that you step into class to uh, take us through uh, uh, various uh, subjects. And indeed, mm -hmm. uh, we were uh, excited, and uh, but also reflectively, we said uh, this is a blessing from God. When we mm -hmm. saw that uh, the confidence that the council had in you, and said that uh, you should uh, stay on for the next five years. And indeed, I think uh, we are all aware that uh, this is at a time when you have also just taken the university through a process of developing a new strategy. And uh, this is a strategy that goes even beyond the five years. So we assume, so we hope uh, that with God's grace, uh, you would be able to bring uh, Desta University to the level that uh, would be uh, the talk of uh, so many people, but that would also be giving glory to God because I think you are among the leaders who have taught us that all that you do uh, avoid the praises from fellow men and women, but do it mm. for the glory of God. And because mm. of that, I think as a class, we said it would be worth it taking a few of our minutes just to make you know when we can still talk to you. Because at times yeah. we keep yeah. uh, passing over so many things. And then uh, uh, later on, people start saying, you know, I know Prof is a very good person, you know, 
we wanted to tell you right now when it is the right time that we appreciate you. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us, I would uh, tell you without uh, mincing words, that mm -hmm. you are among the very open-minded fellows. And mm -hmm. as a lecturer, as a leader in a university, among people that one would feel approachable. So I would mm -hmm. like to urge you to continue with that. And uh, as for us also, we would be remaining open to help you in the journey that uh, is really uh, already marked out for you. It is not an easy one, but we wish you the very, very best in all that you'll be doing. And we thank God that, uh, that there was that unanimous decision that the council and other stakeholders have also been taking stock of what you are able to do. And we also appeal to your team, uh, both uh, those in the faculties and even the support team, uh, to pray for you and also to embrace uh, the vision uh, that now you as a vision carrier is holding. Uh, we wish you everything, every, uh, we wish you all the best and we ask that uh, as we start this class, maybe uh, today, uh, let Jane lead us in the devotion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Prof, you are on mute. Amen. Just, just listen, before, uh, thank you. Uh, Prof, before, before you mm. come in, Mm. Allow me to come in, even though I was not uh, programmed mm. to. So mm. as Africans, uh, we know a way of congratulating someone. Mm. Uh, colleagues having said that, I request that everyone uh, unmute himself or herself. Then mm. we are going to give you a hand clap, just as mm. a sign of congratulation. Yeah. So, mm. uh, so uh, we can all say congratulations, Prof, as we clap for okay. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Over to Jen then. Thank you Over so to much. It's an answer prayer. Um okay. The aspect of uh, leading in devotion comes as a surprise boss. Um, but I'll, I'll share something with us. Uh, I'll share some a, a scripture, Romans chapter 8, um, verse 29. It says, for those God for knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Um, the reason... Some people are so stressed and run down if they feel they have to perform or they have to pretend. They have to keep up with their friends and other people. They have their image on the throne and do things to protect how they are seen. And uh, many times, wherever we are, we try to do things to please people. We try to do things uh, to retain friends. We, we try to do things uh, which we may not necessarily necessarily ascribe to, but we want to fit. But what the Word of God is telling us is uh, we need to take our image off the throne and put God back to the throne. We need to allow mm. God to remain as the king in our lives. Um, challenges are going to come our way. Difficulties are going to come. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, who is the king? Where do we get our strength from when we want to face the challenges or when we want to go through whatever we have to go through? Because this life that God has given us, it's not a smooth life. It's not a life that is free of hardship and challenges. But God's grace is sufficient for us. He will give us the energy. He will give us the strength. He will give us guidance. He will give us direction. And I believe right now, even Prof, as we celebrate you, there's a reason why God still wants you to be in Daystar for another term of uh, five years. I remember in one of the sessions, you mentioned that, oh, these people want me to go on for five years. Uh, sorry, you sounded like you were murmuring and grumbling, huh? 
and you are saying now oh, you don't know whether you're going to go for it uh, probably you will do it as you train somebody and I liked mm -hmm. that part where you said you will go on but you will be training somebody to take to take over from you to me I see that as transformational leadership and mm -hmm. right now I pray for everybody who's in this class um, there is somewhere God is taking you. there is uh, a direction God is leading you in I believe uh, we are not in this class accidentally. There is a purpose God has for each and everybody's life. All we have mm -hmm. to do is allow him to be king. Let's forget about what anybody else uh, might be saying around you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure there are people who, who are discouraging others. Even in this class, they're asking you, why are you going back to school? In this country, you go back to school and uh, there's nothing. There's nothing for you, you know? Um but I'm telling all of us, it doesn't matter what discouragement you're facing today. Um, Jesus is Lord and King, and uh, he has a plan and purpose for each and everybody's life. Mm. We just need to focus our attention on him. Mm. Uh, shall we pray? Okay. Our Father, we come before you this evening. We thank you because you are God. Mm. There is no name above yours. There is nothing that is impossible when it comes to you. We all have different challenges. We all have different difficulties. We all have different situations that we face one time or another in our lives. But mm -hmm. we thank you because you are king, you are God, and you shall help us to walk through these difficult or trying moments. Mm -hmm. We thank you for, we are blessed to have Professor Ayuro as a, one of our instructors. Father, we do not take it for granted that we are here for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. As we sit at his feet and hear and learn from him, mm -hmm. help us to be transformed as individuals. Help us to be transformers at our place of work. Help us to be transformers in our families. Help us to leave a mark wherever we pass because of what we've learned in this class of leadership, God. Help us to tame our tongues, our emotions, our thoughts, and just help us to focus in you, God. For we pray this, believing and trusting in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Oh, my. Yeah, um, I just... Uh, I, I just want to, uh, my, you've uh, put me off balance. So I, I wish uh, Boaz, this should have come at the end of the class, um, the Jane. And, uh, you know, I'm an only child to my mother, so I, I fight uh, emotional spaces like these ones. In a very authentic way, uh, knowing where God has brought me from. And just, you know, being appreciated by fellow human beings is uh, is something very special. Sometimes children don't know when a child just says, Dad, you know, or Mom, you know, I love you, and, and they mean it. It, it is it's so strong. So that's what you've done. Children saying, Dad, we, we appreciate what you're doing and uh, praying for you. And uh, you, you've seen the social media, uh, you know, thousands. Uh, the other day I saw it at 76,000 Kenyans, you know, uh, just saying, you know, we, I met him here, he did this. Uh, so it's it's very nice. So Nasema Santi, Nanini Pia Mbarikiwe. And uh, it is, you You cannot know what that means to me. Uh, so so I can imagine when people die and we are giving those eulogies, I wish, I'm sure that if they are believers, they are smiling, they are, they are listening to what you are saying. But it is, it is even warmer when you get people like you um, saying what you're saying. Because many of you we haven't met. In fact, this whole class, I think I've met two, three, four people interacted. Four, five, not more than five. 
if I stretch my counting. So I am very, very uh, touched. So I would like us, um, today we are looking at leadership, but I want to remind you that um, I really would like to, to thank the 17 plus of you who have already submitted your, your topics. I wanted some time before tomorrow's class to have gone through them and we shall try and scan them back. We'll see, we're thinking of a way uh, to give you initial feedback, but I would like to encourage uh, everybody tomorrow to, to have submitted something. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to look right in your eyes, but just submit so that we use it uh, to help you um, move to the next step. <clears throat> um, so today we're going to we're going to do, I hope we can do three things. We are going to go straight to uh, our book, our, our class book, first and foremost. And uh, I just want to know how many are keeping track, uh, which is uh, the chapter we are looking at today in leadership. I, I want us to read this. <clears throat> I, I also want to direct your thinking on Drucker's paper <clears throat> to see how far we are going with it. And then uh, I have two uh, very strong presentations I would like to do uh, in the class of leadership today. So uh, Jenny Amisi, uh, which which chapter are we on in our leadership book? You told us to look at chapter 20. Chapter? 20. I can't hear you. Emma, is it me? Chapter 20. Yeah, you told us to look at chapter 20. Hmm. Yes. So... Yeah, but I'm coming to that. But before chapter 20, let's go back. Chapter 20 is the substance of today. Uh, uh, teams, and uh, we'll read that after I do the PowerPoint presentations. But uh, I would like us to go to chapter five. Chapter five. Chapter five. Because it's all part of it. Uh, you know, what I've realized uh, in most instances, today, I'm a member of the Kenya uh, board. So at 7, we had a breakfast meeting at Sankara. And uh, we were looking at our strategic plan. And uh, Kenya is a, the Kenya uh, National Agency for Innovation. Um, so we are looking at our strategic plan, and um, we 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 have uh, <clears throat> we are trying to make universities entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial. In other words, to move from theory to practice, and that's why why we are deliberately looking at this book. Uh, we are looking at this book delib deliberately, so that we are. Uh, learning leadership from a practical point of view. And hopefully some of you will become very entrepreneurial in your leadership. You'll be courageous. You will uh, add value to your program. You, you will do the right pricing. Uh, the other day I was fighting with my people when we introduced this course. And I told them I would like to see uh, the pricing of this program uh, uh, be reasonable because I know my audience, I know my clients. And uh, and uh, they, they argued with me and uh, my finance people told me, Ayiro, you know what? You are not uh, you are not uh, you are stepping in the wrong area. Fees is, uh, is uh, can we, can we, can somebody, uh, yeah. Um, 
Can we mute Eugene, yes. please. Eugene, please. Yeah. So they were telling me, you know, uh, fees is determined by the council and so on. I said, uh, uh, but I, I'm an entrepreneur, so I know pricing. And uh, eventually, of course, we 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 had to agree. Uh, and, and that's what I want you to learn. So this Kenya is a very important thing. They want universities to turn and become uh, innovative, the commercialization of products and all those things, which sounds good. It is in the strategic plan. But I told them the biggest, the biggest hurdle uh, is to entrench a passionate vision in in our universities, and it starts with us, vice chancellors, as leaders. A very passionate vision on on what you like to do, and when you have a vision, you have followers. If you don't have a vision, uh, you will not have teams, and if you don't have teams, you cannot deliver. So I want us to to start with the. Uh, Chapter five, I'm hoping uh, that uh, is the key online. I'm just being random. Is the key online. I'll tell you why I'm, I'm, I'm asking. Oh, you're on the road. The key, you're on the road. Okay. So, so we will get somebody else. Um, Maureen Gunjiri, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah, very good. So uh, take us through this small chapter. These small chapters will be reading just one person. Yeah. Chapter five. Okay. Vision. Craft it passionately. A vision is a picture of the future that produces passion in people at Sunshine School. The doctrine of the strenuous, the strenuous life powdered our vision of shining in excellence. Thomas Edison made the first public demonstration of his incandescent light bulb in December 31st, 1879 in Mellow Park, New York. During the demonstration, he said, we will make electricity so cheap that the only rich that only the rich will burn candles. In the late 1800s, the Wright brothers pictured a day when people would soar through the sky abroad a metal capsule with wings. Sorry. In the late 1800s, the Wright brothers pictured a day when people would soar through the sky aboard a metal capsule with wings. 10 years later, on December 17, 1903, the right flyer made its first ascent from a sandy beach in North Carolina, USA. In the 1400s, Billy Graham, a few of his in college... The, in the... Stories. In the 1940s, Billy Graham and a few of his college friends gathered together and dreamed of filling stadiums all over the world presenting the gospel of people who are unaware of God in their lives. As of this writing, through the efforts they have made, two 15 million people around the world have heard the gospel message in person, while well over a billion have heard it via television or radio. Yeah, let, one... us pause. let us pause. Uh, class... Uh, I cannot overemphasize the value of a vision. And I would run, I'd want to challenge each one of us to craft a vision and then inject passion into it. Inject a desire. Inject an endearing fortitude. Thomas Edison is the man who invented the bulb, the electric bulb. You know that it took him 11 years trying. 
stories have it that his wife divorced him because he was so busy trying to get put this bulb up there, run to the wall, touch something, and the bulb comes on. And the brothers-in-law came and told him, Edison, you are mad. How can you imagine? How, of all things, can you imagine a bulb somewhere up there and then you are running to the wall and then you are touching it and light comes? You must be mad. What is, what is real is using a candle. Why are you bothering? Why aren't you just using a candle? Why are you being unrealistic? I'm running towards something. Why are you being unrealistic? What is realistic is to light a candle. I'm a sisi of Africa, like those of us who came from the type of backgrounds. It, what was realistic was to light the koroboi, that tin with a, with a wick and paraffin. But ladies and gentlemen, just imagine what when somebody decides to be unrealistic, they can do. Look at your house. How many bulbs are in it? Look at Nairobi. Look at Mombasa, at Kisumu. Look at Kenya. Look at Tanzania. Look at Africa. Look at the world. One man has changed the civilization of mankind because he decided to have a vision that to many people was unrealistic. What am I saying? Those of us who choose to be realistic change the world. Look at the Wright brothers. They were bicycle commanders. And then the ideas came to them. Now we can get these bicycle things, why don't we try and see whether we can put some wings and, and see whether it can glide? And so what was their imagination? What was their vision? That you could take a metro container, put in 300 people, and throw it across the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean. People ran to them and said, "My, hey, you are mad. You are not realistic. You are being unrealistic because what is realistic is to walk. Why do you want to fly? You walk or at most ride a horse or row a canoe. The Wright brothers chose to be unrealistic, crafted a, a, a vision with so much passion. And I want you just to ask yourself, how much has this aspect of flying changed human civilization? Next month, I fly to the U.S., but I normally don't go to one state. I'll fly almost 10 states, courtesy of the Wright brothers. And then Billy Graham's phenomenal story. You know, church, you would, you would not imagine having a church which is more than 20 feet by 30 feet, what waje kuomba. But he imagined people going into a, st a stadium or colossum and preaching. And look at the number of people, over a billion, have heard the word of Jesus Christ because Billy Graham and a few of his college friends chose to be unrealistic. So what am I saying? Many people tell tell many people tell me, even now, many people tell me, you are being very unrealistic. Uh, be realistic. Nasikatai, it's a nice thing, and we will argue about it in a short while. But me, I know that it is only people who are unrealistic that change the world. That's why we have computers today, because of people like Steve Jobs who saw their, their father, their adopted father, working in the garage with wires with the vehicle and started connecting his own wires and came up with the computers we know it today. 
And and I cannot, and by the way, some of us have such a narrow vision at our main campus in Earth River. If you look at our classrooms, you 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 get scared. There are classrooms for the day star of 20 years ago of 20 students, 15 students. So when I told them I want to put up the school of law complex and I'm going to have a hall that will sit a thousand people. That's unrealistic. How will you, where will you get the money? How will it be done? Uh, I'm talking about crafting your vision with a lot of passion. Not, not so long ago, uh, I, I have done crazy things. And I'm spending some time here because I'm anchoring our lesson today. Uh, when I left Sunshine School, I was taken to Western Province as a provincial director of education. After I left, when I went to Western Province, after I landed in Western, I had 300, 346 secondary schools. And by the time I was finishing my first year, I had stepped, gone into 365 schools, physically. And every day I was in the papers. Uh, Jogo said, no, that is, that is not our style. Bring him back. So I was transferred back. Taking a family to Western after one year, you are back. And I was taken to a place called Casey. It was Kenya Staff Institute. What is called KEMI, the High Ridge. And uh, they, uh, when I joined the dots today, I see what God was saying. God wanted me to, to train more leaders for this country. So I used to meet headmasters, chairman of the board, and other school committees for training. So what did that mean? It meant I only worked in April, in August, and early December, the whole year. So I took my work seriously, the training. We went all over the country. But the bigger picture is that I found I had so much work time I, I enrolled in two masters at a, at a go, one at USIU, one at Kenyatta University. And I finished, when I finished the USIU one, it enabled me to start my PhD at Kenyatta, even before I'd finished the other masters at KU. You can choose to be unrealistic, but you must have a vision. And what, what I asked myself as I left Western, uh, and and all these MPs, um, Kisa Kitui, Bifoli, and all, they made a lot of noise in the papers, Moses Wetangula and, and the rest. Uh, why are you taking our best PDE? But it was God's plan. But what ended up, what, what, what struck me, I asked myself, why am I being thrown around like this? Then I realized, but Ayiro, you have only one degree. It, it hit me so hard. And then I said, I am going to get whatever it takes to stabilize myself. I'm going to choose the life of an academic. So what I'm emphasizing here is that in order to get a, a very uh, sharp and driving vision, you must also be unrealistic. So when, when Moi appointed me as a principal of Sunshine, uh, he told me, I don't want money. I want a name. I told him, Your Excellency, we will try to give you a name. I went back to my teachers and said, we are going to be in the top five in the country on first attempt in this country. That was being unrealistic. How do you start from one class and in four years you are in the top 10? Unrealistic. Carry on, Maureen. The one being common to all these leaders is this. They all had a vision about which they were passionate. At the core of leadership sits the power of vision. The most potent offensive weapon in a leader's arsenal, in my opinion. It had been defined in dozens of ways, but for me, the crispest 
crispest articulation of a vision is that it is a picture of the future that you want that produces passion in people. At, at Sunshine School in 1995, I urged the staff and students to embrace the doctrine of the strainer's life so that our school on its first attempt of the KCSC examination will be placed among the helmet, helmeted wings of academic excellence in our country. Whatever the mental picture of the vision, if those who hear it became passionate about it, sorry, whatever the mental picture of the vision, if those who's, who hear it become passionate about it, then it is already en route to being realized. Your vision might be of a dying school being re revitalized or an established school finding its academic position nationally. It might be a lonely student in your school finding community or a gifted art student finally using his creative gifts to excel and produce something phenomenal. It, is, it also could be your organization needing to overcome perpetual annual financial deficits. There are many life giving visionary pictures of the future as there are leaders among us. And when God finally brings clarity and certain, certainty of vision in a leader's mind, the leader's agenda excels. My dream to one day be given an opportunity to head a school of excellence was triggered by something I read in my dingy papyrus partitioned office in Kegoya. Papyrus, papyrus, majambi. Oh, papyrus. Majambi. Yes. My dream um, to one day be given an opportunity to head a school of excellence was triggered by something I read in my dingy papyrus partition office at Kegoya School in Western Kenya. It was a feature in the Sandel Nation of Dr. Hastings Kamuzu Banda's presidential school in Malawi. Arising out of the description and philosophy of this school of privilege. I submitted to God a prayer that he one day accord me an opportunity to lead a similar institution where the entire infrastructure was in place and the best of students identified and selected. My role would only be to lead the school to the path of excellence. Since the day I read the article on Kamuzu Academy in the Sunday Nation, I can still remember how I felt as vividly as if it were yesterday. In fact, if you strapped a heart monitor to my chest today as someone talks about the beauty or the wonder or the potential of a strong purpose, it would beep and flash. In quotes, abnormal, abnormal, abnormal. I owe my professional prog progression starting a school principal and moving on to be provincial director of education, policy expert in education, researcher, curriculum expert, director, quality assurance, deputy vice chancellor, acting vice chancellor, and finally vice chancellor to that one single moment, a deep prayer and a desire to lead a favored institution. Sunshine School, a presidential school can only have been God ordained for me. The adventure at Sunshine Secondary School, started by President Daniel Arap Moi, still stirs the deepest kind of feelings in me. No other ventures I have undertaken in life elicit the space, the same depth of feelings of endearment. I have had some other exhilarating experiences in my life, but they pale in comparison to what stirs in my heart when it comes to that episode of giving my life to propel a pioneering school into national fame. Vision and passion are inextricably bound together in the life of a leader. God made it so. When through intuition you see God's vision for you, you will know it 
you will know it because you feel you will feel it so deeply in your heart in your heart that over time any lingering uncertainty will vanish so so as a leader do do not ever apologize for the strong feeling you have for the vision that god has put in you for your institution do not hide your feelings about it god wants you to feel as deeply about his vision for you as you do about things you deeply care for i mean that anything paint your god-given vision for your family friends colleagues and total strangers if they will listen paint it with it is scintillating vivacity dexterity and as passionately as you can just get it crafted so that people's hearts are stirred enough to shout count me in well done well done maureen uh uh sasa i want to open some discussion on uh, these thoughts around the vision and this is the essence of leadership and uh, how do you get to this vision remember passion uh ni zile vitu ambazo zinahusika na fikra ya moyo sio fikra ya akili ya moyo ndio sababu tuka, tukaanza na mambo ya emotional intelligence ili ujielewe mwenyewe uh, wewe mwenyewe kwa undani ujielewe na pia uelewe vile unaishi na watu wengine and now we come for to the vision and then after we understand we internalize the vision i'll also be telling you that you can never do it alone you must sell your vision and we shall be asking ourselves what is the best way to sell a vision it is experiential it is rubbed onto people it is not the instruments of your office that will perpetuate that vision and and uh, me and you know we go to offices we go to organizations we see on the gates the vision but when you look at the people inside that organization you don't see any of those things around them uh that means they have not chosen to inject to fuel their vision with passion and how do you how do you get to the threshold of passion is by being unrealistic i want to keep emphasizing this just be unrealistic and you will uh, get the vision that you're looking for okay let's let's open it for some views chris wakesa i can see your hand is up wakesa thank you prof and uh, yes yes prof good evening and thank you for this opportunity um the chapter really has a lot of uh, lessons and especially to us as leaders but most importantly as you said uh passion crafting it uh the, the, the vision being crafted with a lot of passion for you to realize whatever you want to achieve um attention is drawn to the second last state um line just before the chapter ends where you say paint your god given vision for your family friends colleagues and total strangers i want to imagine the vision and the passion that you have for the institution of family the institution of family you have started with strangers you would have yeah. colleagues but why then do you decide to begin with your with the family and then uh then this gift keeps me wondering uh, that uh, even as we come up with uh, visions in life, then they need to begin from the institution of the family. 
before we extend the same to our colleagues, to our friends, and to our strangers. In relation to the same, uh, and in relation to what you've said, that you go to organizations and they have crafted their, their visions outside the main gate, but then when you go to the compound, <clears throat> the same vision is not uh, exercised. And therefore, it gives me a challenge Yes, and the passion for whatever that you want to achieve, but also at the same time, there must be deliberate, decisive uh, action towards the same vision for it to be realized. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, good uh, measure, Sindani? Can see your hand up. Yes. Good evening, Prof. Good evening, my colleagues. Um, Good evening. My, uh, I think I was I was looking at uh, the, the the paragraph that begins up on top of page seventeen, mm. uh, where you talk about the doctrine of a strenuous life. Mm. It reminds me I, I have read somewhere that this this doctrine is associated with the. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th president of the United States. And in, 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 his, in his thinking, he argues that hard work and struggle are the components, the most essential components of a fulfilling, a fulfilling and a, a morally upright life. And yeah. at the same time, I came across another poem by Robert Frost, the road not taken, hmm. where he says two roads diverge in a yellow wood and all that. And I believe in this course, this is very, very relative because, related, sorry, because um, hmm. I think for you starting this course and having to teach through the course was a road not taken by many. And hmm. you had already embraced this strenuous life I've also been moved by your comment on taking two masters, where I am a victim because right now I'm enrolled at the Technical University of Kenya. I'm taking uh, yeah. music education, African yeah. music studies. And that was the first course that I had enrolled in before a friend of mine said this one. So for me, uh, taking these two, with a few friends I talk to, it's a road not taken by many, and I'm very, very encouraged by your comments that you have taken this road. And when I see you, I also believe that I will reach the end. So thank you very much for those words okay. and even what you write here. Asante. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I'm glad you have read uh, Roosevelt's works. Um, I Some of you should visit my library. I don't know whether this book can be seen. Uh, this book is said Spiritual Lives. Uh, Somebody is writing uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, preaching from the Bali pulpit. Uh, a very if if you read the works of Roosevelt, R Roosevelt, uh, you'll be transformed instantly. And uh, that doctrine of the strenuous life is what actually made us become number five on first attempt. Because everybody believed in it so much that we would wake up at four in the morning and everybody would be in class, students and teachers. So I, I, I yes, I, I would encourage, and I'll be giving you certain readers, uh, for those of you who really are thinking of your PhD, you start grind, grounding yourself by uh, reading uh, strong literature around leadership. And this is one man who has influenced me greatly. Uh, Sam Nyabera. Thank you. And, uh, yes. uh, I wanted to uh, join uh, my brother Meshach. Uh, I'm excited 
uh, that uh, he makes reference to Robert Frost's uh, poem, The Road Not Taken. Yeah. Uh, it's not a long time ago I was teaching my students uh, that poetry. And I know uh, the feeling that comes. And uh, I wanted to add to what he said um, by reiterating that uh, what comes out clearly from the reading is that uh, there's an analogy that I've used before, <clears throat> that our life uh, starts at B and uh, ends at D, which means B here is when we are born and D is when we die. But between B and D, there is C. And the C actually stands for choices, the mm -hmm. choices we make in our lives. And uh, I'm, I'm made aware that uh, some of these choices are, are, are so difficult that if they are wrong, we might struggle with them throughout our lives. Because sometimes you do not have the luxury of changing and going back to the beginning. So what I learned from here is that um, life is about choices and we have to make those choices. Some of them are difficult, tough, but necessary. And, and I think that is the hallmark of leadership, that you have to stand on your feet, especially when you find the right place and uh, stick by the choices, even when everybody else has fallen on the wayside. So thank you very much, uh, Prof, for this uh rich book um mm. i know that uh, uh you speak from your lungs you know when when i'm listening your voice actually keeps echoing even when we are away from class I'm, and i'm speaking for myself mm. i keep hearing your voice and i'm like i should be this powerful you know when you speak and and you're like speaking into people's hearts and i, and I believe i'm speaking for a few people here uh, yeah. That it's yeah. it's a privilege to to have you uh, talk to us, especially when you uh, willingly share your life story and how you have come up to where you are today. It gives mm -hmm. some of us mm -hmm. hope that yes, even us, we can make these Thank difficult you. choices yeah. and reach where Wonderful. you have reached. Thank you very much, sir. Wonderful. Wonderful. Very nice. Uh, I'll take one more comment, uh, if there's any. And then we will uh, move on. But I, I would like I would like to emphasize also uh, the class. You only become as good as the books you read. I wish I could emphasize that. Um, whenever I read a book, when I finish reading that book, I am never the same again. I'll carry some thoughts, I'll carry some phrase, I'll carry some concept from that book. So in this very book, I've told people, leaders are readers. If you don't read, you cannot lead. So we shall encourage all of us to, to be reading constantly so that you develop the kind of mental toughness that then becomes your weapon in life so ladies and gentlemen allow me to to share with you uh another aspect of uh, leadership uh, last time we did emotional intelligence, but I would like to talk about teams because you cannot you cannot carry that vision on your own. I want to repeat, you cannot carry that vision on your own. You must have a team with you. That's why you must paint your vision. And uh, you must allow people to help you carry that vision along. So I want to share uh, a very important aspect of leadership, just like we did emotional intelligence last time. And uh, this aspect of leadership 
relates to a team. And I'm borrowing from this book by Patrick Lencioni, which talks about the five dysfunctions of a team. And that's why I asked you to look at chapter 20. The five dysfunctions of a team by Patrick Lencioni. When I get you become my disciples, when you become my total disciples, I'll introduce you to many other books by Lencioni that will, will enrich you as a person. That will enrich you as a person. And uh, I'll be giving you some titles by this same author when it comes to leadership. And after all, what is a leader? What is leadership? Leadership is about influencing people. Influencing people so that they can push you as the leader. So we want to look at the five dysfunctions of a team. What am I saying? We want to look at the things that make you not have a team in your organization. And so since you love the theory, you'll work constantly to overcome those dysfunctions of a team. So let us look at some of them. The first dysfunction of a team is absence of trust. And, and uh, note that this is the biggest dysfunction in a team. That's why I tell people, you cannot be a leader if the people you are leading don't believe in you. So you keep telling people to work hard, but they don't see you working hard. You keep telling people don't come late, but to you, time, timeliness is not a factor. And by the way, what, what I'm doing now, teaching this class, I am trust. Not just in you, this class, but in the whole university community, that I can provide intellectual leadership. And I tell people, don't come to the university, for example, or even a school, or even that business enterprise, when you don't have the expertise. You don't have the expertise. So how am I building trust here? How am I overcoming absence of trust? And I don't know, I want you to understand me on the start. I am doing this by being vulnerable. By being vulnerable. Why am I being vulnerable? I want to be just like any other lecturer and be judged by my students. So I am risking my the authority, the aura of my office by becoming a teacher. I am showing vulnerability. I am building trust. I am removing mistrust. So the first, the biggest dysfunction of a team is absence of trust. It starts with the family. If there's no trust, then Forget about a team. Sorry. The second major dysfunction of a team. No, let, let me let me maybe maybe he wants let me do this. Let me talk about this. Members of teams with an absence of trust do the following. 
conceal the weaknesses and mistakes from one another at family level, at your church, at your working place. They hesitate to ask for help or provide constructive feedback. They hesitate to offer help outside their own area of responsibility. Absence of trust. Iyo ni kazi yao. Kama wanapenda kucheza mambo ya mpira na games, iyo ni shauri yao. Mimi, so long as I go to class or so long as I go to my office at the bank and I finish my work and go away, I don't care. They fail to recognize and tap into one another's skills and experience. I wish I could say this better. And do you know why we fail to recognize and tap into one another's skills and experience? Is because we resist being vulnerable. I've said this before. I became proficient in use of computers and IT courtesy of my secretary in Jogo House. I had no idea what a keyboard was. But I submitted myself to be vulnerable. And every evening, between four and five, uh, Lucy Kaigongi would put me through lessons on my computer. It became a big advantage for me. That time, people would be mesmerized with the simplest of PowerPoint slides, not like these ones I'm doing now. And that's how Saitoti then picked me as a speech writer and allowed me to travel to 57 cap capitals of the world because I could do simple PowerPoint presentations for him and read. I, I recognize and tapped into my secretary's skills and experience. Members of teams with an absence of trust hold grudges. You hold grudges. Kutoka January, paka December. When the results came and somebody said that subject is letting us down bus, you don't even greet each other in a staff meeting. You are looking the other side. You are gossiping about each other for a whole year. The same happens in churches. The same happens in all other organizations. You hold grudges. You dread meetings. Ah, tena meita mkutana mungine. Oh, we are tired of that and find reasons to avoid spending time together. These are members of teams with an absence of trust. How do you overcome overcoming absence of trust? I think it is important to be vulnerable and allow for personal histories exercises, team effectiveness exercises, which I'll be giving you later on, personality and behavioral presence profile, 360 degree feedback. Uh, people thought this was crazy in sunshine. When I said, I don't just evaluate my, my, my faculty, but everybody in the university, I mean, the school evaluates the principal right from the cook. What do you think of the principal? So overcoming absence of trust, you play the leader role in a manner such that you are part of that team. Now, these are members of trusting teams. People who trust each other. They admit mistakes and weaknesses. Please help me. I don't understand. This literature book, I'm not very comfortable with it. That section of chemistry, uh, calculations on enthalpies, I am not very happy with it. And uh, I need you to come and teach in my class. You ask for help. You take risk in offering feedback and assistance. 
you appreciate and tap into one another's skills and experiences. You know, if somebody knows how to, to use the SPSS software, you sit with them and learn. Right now, I'm trying to learn an, a very difficult software on meta-analysis. I, 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 I subscribed uh, for it. It's about 49,000 shillings. I'm going through the courses. I'm just frustrated with my schedule. So I miss many classes, but I must learn. So I've asked one of my research fellows in my office to keep going through it while I'm not around. When I come, they teach me. They focus time and energy on important issues, not politics. Uyo mwanamuke anafanya nini, anatuonyesha nini, anatuonyesha wanaaka na masidis. They offer and accept apologies without hesitation. And they look forward to meetings and other opportunities to work as a group. Members of trusting teams. But remember... Absence of trust will be overcome when you accept to be vulnerable. Suppose I came to class to teach you as a vice chancellor and uh, students started disappearing from the class and going around telling people that man doesn't know what he's doing. You know, I, I allowed myself to be vulnerable and, and I can be damaged. But if you are vulnerable and 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 uh, the the people your audience believes in you, then they begin to trust you. Now I want you to note that. Sorry, I want you to note that because of absence of trust, there is fear of conflict. Because I don't trust you. I don't want to tell you how I feel. There is fear of conflict. I mimi staki maneno na hiyo na huyo headmaster. Staki maneno na huyo HR kwa hiyo organization. Me I, I me I just mind my business. So when you have a staff meeting you are telling them what you want to be done, where you want to go, you want to introduce weekend teaching. You want to have exams every morning. People are not talking in the staff meeting. They're just quiet. They fear conflict. Why? Because they don't trust you. And then the moment the staff meeting is over, they run to the center of the field. If it's a school, they, they run to the center of the field because at the center of the field, you can see who is coming. Or they go into the offices and lock themselves up, two, three, four people. Yule mjinga alikuwa anasema nini? Mimi nitakuwa nakuja tu Jumamosi, nakuja tu. So the the principal and the deputy are very happy. They see bodies moving into class for example. But then they those people go to class and say open page this uh, you read and answer the questions that follow. Then they go to their phone on social media. Do you see why absence of trust is so so dangerous because it results in fear of conflict and teams that fear conflict have boring meetings nobody is say, saying anything uh, and jen onyango what do you think of this jen anazungusha kichwa what do you think of that one anaitika how about this one? Ah, Bona Principal. I think I agree. Uh, and then the whole staff, you go around, nobody is saying anything in the staff room. 30, 40, 50 teachers. And then, of course, you turn to the most vulnerable person, the deputy. 
you ask the deputy, deputy, what do you think of this program? Deputy Nasema Obana, principal, I don't know. I don't know which angel brought you here. We were just wasting our time in this school. Since you came now, we have seen the light. You create environments where back channel politics and personal attacks thrive. And I'll be dealing with this more directly. How do you deal with this? And for me, in my management, in my teams, they know. If the VC is not happy with something and you're the author, he will have a management meeting and he will address that matter and he will address you. And we have our tunnel of chaos. We argue, we quarrel. But when we finish, that matter is settled. Otherwise, you create environments of back channel politics and personal attacks. What happens? You ignore controversial topics that are critical to team success. You don't discuss the difficult things. You don't tell somebody now, you see, this thing you are saying of constant exams is not helping. We are not moving the mean. So maybe we need to introduce clinics where we give more attention to the weak students. You can't say that. Why? We can't say that. Why? Because you don't want conflict. That's what we are saying. You fail to tap into all the opinions and perspectives of team members. And you waste time and energy with posturing and interpersonal risk management. Teams that engage in conflict have lively and interesting meetings extract and exploit the ideas of all team members. They solve real problems quickly. They minimize politics. They put critical topics on the table for discussion. I hope I'm speaking to many of you. And some of you are, are, are seeing those realities. Prof, a question before you move on to the next slide. Yes. Uh, that that slide that uh, you you you've been teaching. Yeah. Teams yeah. that engage in conflict. Yeah. I don't know if it's my understanding. Teams that engage in conflict minimize politics. Yes. There's no politics. Can can somebody help me answer a question on that one? Yeah. Especially uh, politics and the first one. Uh, and in Meetings. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jen Amisi and then Nyawita, help me answer that one. Um, uh, good evening, everybody, once again. Uh, good my, evening. My, my, my understanding of that is uh, engaging in conflict does not mean you create conflict. But when you when the conflict arises, you actually find ways of mitigating it. You address it. You don't push it under the carpet. Mm. And when you're addressing the, the conflict, uh, I, I I tend to believe you're, you're doing it in a rational manner so that you are not uh, bringing in petty politics. You're not uh, building a mountain out of a molehill. Mm. Yeah. So that the issue has arisen. There's some some conflict. I, I don't like this person because because of A B C D. 
for instance. So issues may arise, not because that they, they have failed when it comes to their work, but probably because of my personal opinion of them. So can we deal with that difference in opinion and learn that we probably don't have to be friends, but if it, if it means working in the same organization or institution, then we yeah. have to share ideas that are going to build the institution. Let's put our mm. differences as, aside. Very good. That, well done. Yeah, that is my yeah. take. Yeah. Nyawita, uh, very nice, Jenny. Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'd like to, to answer this by pointing out two things. First is that the five dysfunctions of a team is, is built on a pyramid with the trust being the foundation. So when you come to conflict, it is a conflict that is first based on trust. So Lencioni says that people who trust each other can speak truthfully without fear of rejection. So mm. that itself makes it possible for them to have lively and interesting meetings because they, they don't fear rejection and they trust each other. And also Lencioni redefines conflict as a passionate pursuit of truth. Mm. And so it's not conflict, yeah, vita, no, no, no. We are having different ideas and we are seeking which one is the best. We are seeking, mm. the, it is called now constructive conflict. And yeah. anywhere where people have constructive conflict, where it is objective and not subjective, the meetings are always lively. The, the people focus on the real problems. And there's little or no politics because we're working on this project, just bring your idea, we uh, talk about it, and that's on. So I think this makes sense to me, and that's how I see it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, so, note. At the base of this pyramid, thank you, uh, Nawita, for bringing that up, is the absence of trust. Where there's absence of trust, there is fear of conflict. Why? Because I don't trust you, I can't tell you the truth. I'd rather keep quiet. Then there is lack of commitment. Because I feared to express my views about Saturday teaching, I'll not be committed. I'll come. I'll go to class, but I will not be committed. So look at this. A team that lacks commitment is You know, we couldn't do that exam because the volleyball team had gone to Kabarak. That is creating ambiguity on direction and priorities. Misses opportunity by too much analysis and delay. We are still looking at this because if we don't do this, these students will not understand this. Breeds lack of confidence and fear of failure. Discusses and reviews decisions again and again. Have you gone to this organization where one item has been on agenda throughout? I've just had that experience in Daystar. We've been talking about the history book for the last one and a half years. We went out as management for 10 days at Stony Earthy. We came to Lukenya Getaway another 10 days. And uh, I told them by Tuesday this week, I want the draft of that book in whichever form. You keep doing the same things over and over again. When you see that, it is lack of commitment. You encourage sec sec second guessing among team members. Nobody really knows where you want to go as a team. So you should note that teams that are committed have a clear, have clear directions and priorities, are aligned around objectives, develop an ability to learn from mistakes, seize opportunities before the competition, move forward without hesitation, change direction without hesitation or guilt. Yes, we are trying this thing. It is not working. Let's do it this other way. Commitment. So like, like this course, uh, Masters in Education in, in Leadership and Policy Studies, or Policy Studies and Leadership, this, this course, 
if there was if 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 there was no commitment you'd begin to see a lot of this ambiguity in terms of direction and priorities too much noise about how should we teach research methods should we have two, two, two people teaching research methods too much analysis and delay and then we'll be saying no 18 months is too is too is too is too short let's add another 3 months So where is this lack of commitment? So you see, absence of trust. Because I don't trust you, I don't want conflict with you, and therefore I'll not be committed. And then, avoidance of accountability. That's one of the worst things. Avoidance of accountability. Where now, you hear people saying, Ah, you ni shauriao, mimi section yangu in our bank, we are okay. Or, we teachers of English did well. Our English was okay. Or, ah, chemistry, you can't compare chemistry to maths. But not knowing that if maths doesn't perform, it doesn't matter how well your English or Kiswahili does, the school will not perform. So there is avoidance of accountability. Me, me I'm not part of that. Me, I'm doing my best. If they're not doing their best, that's their business. Avoidance of accountability. So a team that avoids accountability creates resentment and different performance standards. It encourages mediocrity. It misses deadlines and deliverables. And a team that avoids accountability push all the burden of discipline to the leader. So when you are head of department is trying to get you working, you are saying, no, we are not working well because of the head of department. Yes, or the deputy director in this organization. So you push the burden of discipline to the leader. Now, teams that are committed do this. So look at your, your home base. They ensure that poor performers feel pressure to improve. And Ani, you are the one letting us down. Identify quickly problems by questioning one's approach without hesitation. We are not doing well in Kiswahili. Matoke yetu katika lugha ya Kiswahili Ni, ni kisababu ni kwamba kile kitabu cha fasihi haki kufunzo vizuri mwaka jana and you are saying it establish respect among the team who are held to the same standard everybody is expected to perform avoid excessive bureaucracy around performance management and corrective action bureaucracy is a cancer. Yes, Nyawita, I can see your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't take it down. Sorry. Oh, okay, fine. So, just look at teams that are committed. I like this one. Identify quickly the problem by questioning one's approach without hesitation. And you establish respect among the team who are held to the same standard. I I I I, I will give you these notes so you read them. Um, but this is very important: overcoming avoidance of accountability. You publish publication of goals and standards. No one can ignore them. And you will know who is responsible for what. Progress review, simple and regular. So team members should comment on their peer performance against objectives and standards. So it's not about, Henry, you know you're not teaching well. Henry, you're not meeting the standards we have set. 
we said we are going to progressively move the mean of this subject to this level. We said we are going to increase the revenue streams in our organization. They reward the team instead of individuals because we are all doing well. And we do not relegate accountability to consensus approach. Uh, shared team responsibility with individual responsibility. So be very careful with consensus. You must also begin to get the individuals to account. So I, I'm deliberate about this pyramid. Notice the biggest, the shouting one, absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment. Because you, you are not committed, you avoid accountability. And then inattention to results. When you hear members in an organization say, uh, if people are not graduating with PhDs on time, that is not my problem. Me have taught. First of all, that tells avoidance of accountability, but then it goes to inattention to results. Two years ago, I was embarrassed as a vice chancellor because the School of Communication did not have a single person graduating with a PhD. And it was seen to be normal. After that graduation, the following year, I designed a roadmap for all the schools having PhD and masters. And I put excessive pressure for performance and told the School of Communication, you are our flagship. Can I know why we didn't have one, even one person graduating with a PhD? Oh, you see, these students, they are working, they are not interested, they are not, I said no. The problem is not the students, the problem is us. Because these are not people who have been forced to come to our classes. They have an intention. Do you know, last year we graduated eight PhDs and over 60 masters in the School of Communication, from zero to eight. Why now there was attention to results? Everybody from that January up to November when we were graduating, everybody's attention was, my God, where are we? We have already started this year. They are already telling me the number of PhDs, the number of masters, and we are going to measure where are they? Have they done chapter one, chapter two, chapter three? Are they out in the field? So I'm not getting shocks and surprises. But when you don't have commitment, avoidance of accountability, you have inattention to results. That is their problem. So graduation doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Uh, according to them, graduation doesn't make any sense. Whether they graduate them or not, that is not the problem. That's the problem of Daystar. We said it will never happen again. So I, I want you to note the five dysfunctions of a team. And ladies and gentlemen, leadership is about having functional teams. Just look around you. Look at our government, look at our county governments, look at institutions. Many institutions have collapsed, have run bankrupt, have been dissolved. It starts with leadership that has no vision and then a leadership that is sitting with all these dysfunctions of the team within themselves. I want to pause there for some comments as we go to the second 
presentation. Any comments, any revelation? Uh, does this does this engage you? Does this sound familiar? Uh, Boaz. And then Julia Totiano, and then Chris. Hello? Yes. Yes, thank you, uh, Prof. I wanted to add my voice uh, by actually indicating. I don't know whether my connection is still unstable. You are clear, you are clear to me. So I don't oh, know about you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to add my voice and particularly say uh, that uh, the element you have uh, brought there on the avoidance of accountability. Mm. I see it and through it, it contains a lot of things which actually can even be the killer uh, component, particularly mm. where members of the team are only members who each and every one of them only looking at what to, uh, to run away with and uh, mm -hmm. not concerned also about uh, how to manage the stakeholders and be accountable to them. Uh, because you see, a, a leadership position, a leadership role, it's actually, uh, in as much as it is ordained by God, it's a privilege that uh, is thrust upon one to discharge. But where there's no accountability, it means that you cannot be actually asked. And even before you are asked, the leader cannot go, or a part member of the team cannot go out of their way to explain to the others and to many other stakeholders who depend on the services uh, that the team do provide. Yeah. And in that yeah. case, you'll find that uh, many of the times then uh, uh, people lose completely the focus. I think they were the, the inattention to results do a match. Mm -hmm. And people lose focus, they are not even sure where were they going. Uh, because mm -hmm. by the end of it all, you only realize people are praising themselves how they were able to avoid maybe having sanctions. Because uh, these are members of the team that by the end of the year, they only regroup to say, you know, uh, I escaped this, I escaped that, you know. I think that really is a very dangerous sign. Thank you. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Very, very intuitive. Yes. And, and as my master's students, please engage in deep reflection based on your own circumstance. Uh, you know, and sometimes I tell people, even when I reach a level where I, I am feeling I don't want to conflict, uh, I should not be persuaded to stop being committed. Because <laughs> the victim is a, the customer. Yeah, when you, when you don't have that commitment, the person who suffers most, okay, the leader eventually, but it is the customer. And then avoidance of accountability. Uh, sometimes some of us are so shameless about it. Uh, uh, you, you know your subject or your area is not doing well. And it doesn't bother you because you think, me, I decided I was not going to bother. And so the organization crumbles. Yeah, very good. Next. Thank you so much, Prof. And I, yeah. as I could, I, as I still carry on with these uh, classes on leadership, the more I just realize how I am at a lower percentage, uh, there's a lot that I really need to do. And uh, yeah. maybe before I, I handle this, I had an incident this weekend Later on, yeah. when I sat down, yeah. I was trying to remember the inter uh, emotional intelligence uh, we were handling. It was with a student who who appeared to be very rude, and uh, it's because he, uh, he didn't have my work, uh, most of the notes, and he's a candidate. And so uh, we, I, I had a confrontation with him because he was just uh, responding rudely, and he really didn't care. 
And even it reached mm. a point he was like ready to fight me. In fact, he was like, Malimu, you're not going to talk to me like that. You'll not handle me like that. And he was now coming to fight. And I really got so annoyed. And I remember I, I slapped him severely. And I was like, you want to fight me? And so many mm. words that as a teacher I can mention. And so, mm. yeah, yeah, because I, when I saw he was becoming uh, difficult, I told him, let's let's go talk to this in the staff room. And even there, mm. he, he showed some kind of indiscipline. And the other teachers had to come in. In fact, the male teachers, they were like, how can you address Molimo like that and so on? And so mm. I became so furious and so emotional. And I was like, I don't even want to see in my class. I can't teach somebody, a, a student who feels they are above me and they cannot obey so mm. later on, when I sat down, I was like, was it really the best? Did I have to be get that angry? Why couldn't I keep mm. quiet and, and so on? So my emotional intelligence was, was put at a test. And I really mm -hmm. felt I failed. I failed and I acted in out of anger and the pain I felt being uh, directed to me by somebody who is younger and who should be submissive and listen to what I'm telling them. And uh, so it really brought me down, Prof. And I really felt so mm. as a failure, a failure so much. And I was like, and I've, I've been taught emotional intelligence and why couldn't yes. I apply it here? Yes. Yes. So yes. Do, do, we, do we make mistakes? And when you make mistakes, can, <laughs> yeah, is there room for improvement? Because, you know, to me, there's a point you said, and I really took it at heart sometimes back that some of you, you will even do this master's and you will just have it on papers, like a certificate, but it will not be seen in your life. Mm. And so I've always mm. wanted this master's to be real in my life. And I'm really trying to apply it in everything that I do. And at least something when we, when we learn from here, I take it up as a leader, a leader that I am, that I'm a teacher, not maybe in the position of a school, but I am a teacher. So my leadership starts from there. What am I practicing? Mm. And so on. And uh, I'm looking at what you are guiding us here today. And I'm also mm. like, hey, God, I think there's a lot. Eh? And I, I appear in that group because I'm not a leader, but maybe I'm part of maybe some people like the absence of trust. I fear opening up to the principal or even the those who are above me because I am like, I don't I don't feel I'm comfortable about it. Then there's the fear of conflict. Sometimes questions are asked. I am quiet. I don't talk. And where I, I am, it's, my, it's a new workplace. And somehow I, I, I tend to be, uh, talkative, not talkative in terms of talking too much, but I really try to, <laughs> sorry for that, I really try to speak up when something is not really working out because I'm, I don't want to be in the group of people coming mm. back later and sitting down and we are not mm. part of this because I ask them, like, they, they, there is a policy that was passed, like, when exams are done, they're supposed to be marked within a week and people are struggling to do that. Then I'm asking them, but why don't you, why don't you raise this up, especially when you're having briefs in the meeting? Because you are the people who, who consented to this. Does it mean that, you know, sometimes I realize teachers when the school is almost closing and or maybe you are going for a break and we are having a meeting, people just mm. say yes, yes, everything because of the excitement of leaving the school. And mm. uh, we just say yes because we want the meeting to end very fast so that we go to our own business. And then later on, we come to realize that this thing is putting us down. And now we mm. start complaining. So mm. I did. I really didn't want to be part of that. The part of the ones who are standing in the field, like we put it, and and I think when you are talking, you are bringing out the teachers so uh, very well. I, maybe because you are you are a teacher and you are, you are just mm. speaking our minds, the things that people would say. What was that guy saying? What was that woman saying? And mm. so on. And I think it is so bad. So to me, mm. I mean, I'm at that point, Prof. And yes, yeah. but I, yeah. I thank God that in this area of inattention to results, I'm really trying that. I want results. It's really, it really bothers me when my students are not doing so well. It really bothers me when they don't have notes and I, that is part of what they need to pass. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I'm, not of, I'm not of the side of that is the problem of the school. In fact, I'm starting with the classes I'm handling. How are they doing? What am I doing to improve them and so on? So thank you so much as I go through this journey, but sometimes I really feel embarrassed. Like, am I really bringing out the, uh, the leadership that I'm learning from this master's program or... I'm still the same Juliet and so on. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I like that self-evaluation. Uh, uh, it tells me we are getting somewhere because that's what it is all about. Um, uh, if if you change, uh, that, that's, that's the biggest outcome, not, not the grade. If you get 
if you get an A in this course, then you're just validating that. But I would, my desire is to see many of us change and and and, and become better because the the future is in your hands, you people. Uh, many of us are going to exit in the coming few years, so it's, the future is in your hands. Next, the next hand up. Hello, good evening, Prof. Yes, Nyota, go ahead. Yes, I would like to, 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 to relate to what you're just sharing today with what I went through last week. I think we're having mm -hmm. the gender-based violence uh, idea marathon at, at Daystar. And I yes. attended and I had an idea. And you said mm -hmm. the first round, they were the, everyone was presenting and there was voting. And then the next stage was the best 10 will go to, to, to the next stage and was to present the following day. Now, on the absence of trust, this pyramid that you've shown us here, I really experienced it firsthand. When mm -hmm. uh, the person who came in and... Um, and, and trusted my idea was my classmate, uh, Leah, and, and she really pushed me and told me, you need to just, just continue with this. So when we made it to the top 10, the people who are organizing the, the, the event decided that those people who lost, the other 18, were to join specific groups. Now, mm -hmm. you know what, what they did was actually bring competitors with different ideas to work on an idea that appears to be better than theirs, and that killed the trust totally. So I was in this group of four people and everyone was mm. pushing the idea and they couldn't even even mm. listen to the idea I had initially. And it reached a point when I said, actually, guys, this was my idea. Then people stopped uh, giving their opinions honestly. You could see how people are not saying what they're actually supposed to say. Only yeah. only, only yeah. one person could, could be free. That was Leah. And then finally, it reached a point where people were not even committed. Now, the following day, when we woke up in the morning and the work was too much, people were not committed. Eventually, when we were a few minutes to the presentation, they all left, and I only remained with Leah. And they, 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 they weren't even careful to check what were the results. Nobody wanted to be accountable for anything. I'm, I'm grateful that we presented, and it was, it was good. Well, we didn't win, but it was okay. But my point is that I felt this, this pyramid, these dysfunctions of a team first and last week. And today I'm looking at your class and I'm like, okay, so this is what actually happened and it make, it's making a lot of sense. Thank you for bringing Wonderful. this today. Thank you. Wonderful. So uh, I think we go to Othello, then uh, we finish with the Okesa. Thank you, Prof. Mm. Uh, you know, when we came in today, we started with this this program, which was led by boys. You know, I thought, <laughs> now I've got I got a breaking news for this guy. <laughs> then yeah. boys and the rest already got the information. I said, oh, thank God, my colleagues have got the information. When I got the information, that has been my prayer, and I, I'm just thankful to God that this happened. I'm sure mm -hmm. if you remember our class time, I always be. Uh, alluding to this that this program that we have started is my prayer that we will complete it when you when you keep talking about transition 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 that always has been my prayer and god answered the prayer all right mm -hmm. so the aspect of uh when we are looking at these five dysfunctions i just wanted to agree with my friend boas about the mm -hmm. danger the second one of avoidance of accountability is a very dangerous Thing to do in an organization because when you do mm. like this, the, 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 the chances, the potential danger that you are bringing is the collapse of the organization. But if you are not accountable, then things will just go here. I was working before joining JSTAR as an undergraduate, I was working mm. in a Christian mm. radio station back in Liberia, and then the, the white people were running that, we were the nationals were. In, were charged with the responsibility of doing uh, delivering news and other aspects of the radio station. It was run by missionaries, American missionaries, very top, top missionaries who were running this organization. Mm -hmm. So they sent students from America to do internship at the station. And these students, I think four or five of them were put under my care. At that time, we were in a difficult situation whereby 
people that they, 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 they declare some of our colleagues were down there and there's so much work given to me. I had to go up and down during the day searching for stories, go for news, and then come back and then do programs. I was doing a 30 minute program every evening. And then I was charged of taking our allowances for the newsroom and distributing to my friends. So when you are doing this work, there is a lot of pressure on you. The way our, our sister was talking about that, when you get into that pressure, you really have to call the Spirit of God to, to, to calm you down, for you to be able to respond to people appropriately. Yes. Otherwise, you can be under pressure. Words can come from you which you did not intend. So mm -hmm. this is what I want to just say. It is a, it's a situation when you get into this a leadership aspect where you have to call the Spirit of God to cool you down. Mm -hmm. So that mm. God will take control of your emotion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, finally, uh, okay, sir. Prof, thank you. Uh, I share my my sentiments with my colleagues, which have already spoken before me. And uh, just not to waste time, I wish to say, Prof, I thought I was a leader mm. until I joined this program. Mm. I have then realized that I, I was only trying to be a leader. I have not become a leader yet. Because each day you teach us something, I realize mm. that uh, there are so many shortfalls on my leadership uh, style. And therefore, I feel I am becoming a better person, better person each day. And mm. that's what I can pick. Something that I've actually learned today Mm. That indeed, in a team, absence of trust then disintegrates the whole team. And therefore, as a leader, I need mm. to always make sure that there is trust within the members, trust to me as a leader and any other person that uh, is within my, my, my team. And therefore, mm. thanks, Prof. This is, this is really so nice and good. Okay. Uh, I think I am becoming a better person. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Now, I want I want to do this. Um, I want you to go to your paper on Draka. Uh, let me stop sharing for a moment. I want you to go. Everybody, uh, search out Draka. Peter Draka. The paper. And uh, if you have ever been a student of a hero, I want you to be a disciple of Draka. Uh, and uh, this is this is a wish. I want you to be a disciple of Draka. And I gave you the first assignment. And. Uh, I want us to go to Draka, page 409, where we have uh, Draka as a social, uh, no, not 409, sorry, 407, page 407. 407. We... He, we covered the spiritual philosopher and uh, essentially we were saying that moral values and the strength of character develop the spirit while advancing the practice of management. I want everybody to write that, uh, that phrase somewhere. That moral values and strength of character develop the spirit while advancing the practice of management. I, I don't know how to emphasize that. So every all of us write that, uh, and this is not a hero, this is Drucker's philosophy. 
recognize that moral values and strength of character develop the spirit while advancing the practice of management. These are anecdotes I want you to, to walk around with in your mind. Continue writing, indifference, indifference, comma, on the other hand, comma, being indifferent to moral values and strength of character, and therefore having no spirit. So write indifference, comma, on the other hand, was the grave sin, the grave sin, ilina kuingiza kwa kaburi, was the grave sin of, of the 20th century. Brackets, Draka, 1979, brackets closed. Semicolon. The dangerous, continue writing, the dangerous, put in quotes, moral numbness, the dangerous moral numbness, Uh, 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 quotations closed, the moral numbness that poisons mind and soul Enough. because the dangerous moral numbness that poisons mind and soul because it makes both blind to compassion. I, I want I want us to reflect on this. Before I run through, summarize what I've taught today in team dysfunctions. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, there are these anecdotes that I hope to leave with you uh, in my class of leadership. And that they will keep urging you to be different in whatever you do. Uh, let me just bring this up again for clarity. Uh, bring that up. Uh, <clears throat> let me see whether I can share this. Yes, I can. This is what I'm saying. There we are. So this is what I'm saying. And, and, and I would like some of us to, to intellectualize or idealize. Draka's philosophy, this is Draka as a spiritual philosopher. Draka's philosophy recognizes that moral values and strength of character develop the spirit while advancing the practice of management. Indifference, on the other hand, was the grave sin of the 20th century. The dangerous moral numbness that poisons mind and soul because it makes both blind to compassion. Now I, I want us I want to be provocative. Uh, I want us to be provocative. So boys, um why 
Why are people bothered whether a hero has a forged PhD or master's or not, and he's the governor of Nairobi, for example? And I want you to, to hold on to that. Okay. Badu. Yeah. Okay. I want you to, to I want you to think through that. And I also want to give you the example. Why was the president of Harvard stripped of the office recently? Because somebody went to her PhD and found that uh, she had done, she had plagiarized, and yet she had been very hard on other people on similar matters in the recent past. I'm just talking about moral values and strength of character when it comes to leadership. Comment, Boaz. Mm, thank you, Prof. Uh, I think my comment would just begin by indicating that uh, first and foremost, if proven that you are able to forge a certificate and you are getting into a serious office, what prevents you from uh, forging other things within that office? In other words, you do not have the integrity that would be a key requirement to enable you actually be somebody that is trustworthy uh, be somebody that uh, anybody can feel, uh, re it can rely upon. And mm -hmm. that moral decadence in itself uh, actually disqualifies you to be in a position to manage any public office or public affairs. So it, you need not necessarily be in a particular office. And indeed, I think uh, when you also made reference to the uh, president of Harvard who was stripped because of plagiarism, and uh, plagiarism, uh, of course, uh, it's been a serious issue uh, the world over, but also closer home in Kenya, I know that uh, uh, many of us, uh, uh, a little bit, who have been within the governance sector, exposed to a number of things, you know that there are a certain uh, number of uh, high-flying uh, individuals mm. who, upon being discovered that they plagiarized the work that they presented as their own, uh, mm. that diminished even the stature. And mm. uh, but for me, it is not even just about the stature of a person but it is uh, what exactly is then the package that we have been seeing in this uh, person. Because uh, I think the leadership responsibility that these individuals have mm -hmm. is one that then uh, acts even without being consulted or be, without being asked as a mentorship process. Because mm -hmm. many young people look at them as a moral compass. Uh, as uh, people who know the true north where the direction should be. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that then uh, they realize that all we were thinking was actually the epitome of all these virtues actually mm -hmm. has a totally wanting uh, capacity or integrity and strength uh, to offer that kind of leadership is uh, mm -hmm. actually short of the trustworthiness that you'd be expecting of such a person. So for me, that is how I look at it. And then people then become so wary and they start feeling like, oh, so what next? Because then uh, you are more like the light uh, that now has, has almost uh, implied that where you are, there cannot be any trust on anything good to come out of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I want you to relate your life. I want you to relate your desire for leadership to it 
boiling down to more values and strengths of character and therefore having a passionate vision, being unrealistic, and therefore becoming or adhering to the practice of management that brings change. But what does indifference do? What does indifference do? Uh, is and, and, and I'm talking about a real case, a case study. Is is Nairobi with with the with all due respect? Why has a Nairobi changed? And we were promised many lofty things. I went to Kangemi the other day looking for uh, Managu and Sisa Gand. The, 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 the rubbish, the dumping of rubbish, which I was told would be gone in, 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 in the first 90 days. Why is that so? Uh, me, I'm very clear. Because indifference to moral values and strength of character is the grave sin that causes moral numbness. So you can drive your Lexus across. There's a moral numbness. You don't think you owe anybody anything. It doesn't matter. Because that no moral numbness Poisons mind and soul, and you are blind to any kind of passion or compassion. So this is this, and some people don't realize that. By the way, we we take it as a very simple matter. Kwani, it's not about degree or or whatever. It has nothing to do with that. If you are if you are if you came in and said you didn't have a degree, that is different. So I'm trying to say something here, and I'm being very provocative because uh, my spirit tells me to bring this up as part of my training of you to become leaders. And uh, if you have committed that sin, uh, then you submit to it and you'll be forgiven. And then you won't walk around with those that more because that aspect itself, by the way, you'll be actually fighting and living a lie in this moral numbness that poisons mind and soul. Nani anajali, mimi sijali, whatever they say, mimi you know that moral numbness. So I, I I want to push you a little harder to appreciate what. What leadership is all about. Now it's then Othello. Very briefly, because I have another presentation to do before the class here. And uh, so thank you, th thank you, Prof. Uh, I'll just like to to say summarily in page four hundred and eight of the document that we are reading about Draca. That there's this mm. this press that says that. Similarly, in management challenges for the 21st century, Draca reminded the, re the readers that values are the ultimate test. And, and I yeah. think that answers to our questions. Values are the ultimate test. People will test you on your values, not what you promise and what you've done, but on your values. Thank you. Thank you very much. Othello? Yes, Prof. The aspect of moral numbness we are talking about here. The Bible refers to this as the conscience being seared with a hot iron so that you mm. feel nothing. When you do wrong, it's just it's just like punt to you. You have no any feeling of being. Mm. No, there is no feeling of guilt. This moral mm. numbness is like that. And, uh, mm. It's very well described in the Bible. And then mm. I would say that uh, the question of the Harvard University president the, the racial card there could have been a case if this this question this moral question was not there because the moral question destroyed her case of the moral card that she's a black woman she was a black woman but now mm. the question of the moral the moral question has already uh, uh, dismissed her in that situation once that mm. is proven it is it, it has now put a sting on her case thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so so I know I know politics is divisive, but uh, we are in a leadership class, and we we can 
to use any case studies that are very difficult to handle. <laughs> But but I I just want I want you to note that we are not here. Uh, uh, one we are in an intellectual endeavor, but two, we must turn this into reality. And uh, learn that uh, a spirit comes out of moral values and character. That's what gives birth to a spirit, and the spirit will advance the practice of management. But if, if you become indifferent to that, then you bury that spirit and you have what we are calling moral numbness. So that's that's very important. Um, I also feel I need to very briefly um, engage with you uh, as a class on a few, just, just give me a minute, on a few problem areas so the spiritual philosopher, I leave it to you. I want you now to go to page to page 409, the social ecologist. Draka as the social ecologist. And what I'll be asking of you in our next class is I'll pick on anybody to expose on Draka as a social ecologist. Now, to make sure that we have thorough reading, I also want this highlighted and annotated as your second assignment on this paper. Please take down, highlight and annotate And then give me a synopsis of one page. Double space, font 12. Double space, font 12. So you're going to highlight, you're going to annotate, and you're going to write a synopsis uh, double space font 12. So, Prof, is it the, the area of the, the social ecologist only? Only, only. Okay. Okay. Draka as a social ecologist only. Please note that. Only. I repeat. Only. Thank you. All right, now allow me to summarize what we have done today. And I'm happy at least we have kept <laughs> we have kept to what I wanted to cover. Uh, allow me to summarize what we have done today. And I'm just going to run through these slides to, to summarize the five dysfunctions of a team. And that's a very strong component. So how am I covering leadership in this class? I am doing leadership in a modular form. I covered transformational leadership. I have done emotional intelligence. I am doing dysfunctions of a team. And we are religiously wanting to understand the guru of management, Peter Drucker, to contextualize leadership. And so I have one more topic uh, to cover, leadership in the 21st century, the new constructs that surround leadership. That will come to. So 
I, I want to to share with you to summarize. Um, let me see whether I can get this. Um, Um, and give me your attention here. So notice, uh, uh, after this, you go and read chapter 20 in our class text, uh, The Art of Institutional Leadership, just to reinforce what I'm covering now. So the five dysfunctions of a team and 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 I would like to emphasize uh, that um, there are uh, several books. Uh, the one we are using, the five dysfunctions of a team. There is this one by the same author. Um, this one by the same author is truth about employee engagement. Uh, so you have to read uh, the same Lencioni. I have about four of his books. Uh, after, after you have covered the dysfunctions, you really want an employee to be engaged, not to come to work, not to attend meetings, but to be engaged. So we'll be dealing with some of this 21st century leadership takes us into making sure that your employees are engaged uh, at their place of work so that we don't have job misery, as, as we say. Now, I'm running through this. I'm not going to teach. I am running through this very fast uh, because it's one other thing I've just remembered I wanted to do before you go. Uh, so... So what is leadership? And, and, and I hope you know what I'm saying here. Leadership is an identifiable set of skills. That's why I'm, 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 I'm using a modular approach identifiable set of skills and practices that are available and is a relationship between those who aspire to lead and those who choose to follow managers versus leaders i'm going to send you these presentations managers versus leaders I'm quoting from Covey, Stephen, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and Cotton and John, Leading Change. So don't, don't say I am an expert in leadership. I'm an authority in leadership. If you have not punished yourself to read books around leadership. So that's the difference between managers and leaders. Managers and leaders, I'm tempted to ask uh, Desmond, uh, not Desmond, Esther, Esther Jen. Esther Jen, are you there? Or Evans Lusasi, are you there? Evans, I can see you on the net, on the on the platform. Faith Nzuki, are you there? Yes, I am. Who is that? Faith. 
Look, Evans, Evans here. Evans, you are there? Yes. Yeah, you're loud enough. Can you just tell us, just read us this slide. I just want to be sure. Managers versus leaders. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, managers versus leaders. And so you'll be reading managers versus leaders. Yes. Okay. Uh, for managers, managers know how to plan, budget, organize, uh, staff, control, and problem solve. While on the other hand, leaders create and communicate visions and strategies. Um, for managers, they deal mostly with the status quo, while the leaders deal mostly with change. Uh, another aspect of managers is that uh, management is a bottom line focus. How can I best accomplish certain things? How can I best accomplish certain things? Well, leadership deals with top line. What are the things I want to accomplish? Lastly, management is doing things right, while leadership is doing the right things. Yeah, so when I send you these slides, it will consolidate your understanding of leadership. And I hope some of you are picking ideas from this for your thesis as you plan your topics. This is fill-in material. Okay, now I'm just going to go running. Uh, six leadership styles. Goldman. Uh, and I'm not going through that, coercive, authoritative, affiliative, democratic, pace setting, coaching. Exemplary leadership. Uh, exemplary leadership. Hey, exemplary leadership. Ochami, Francis, are you there? If not, yes, there, I'm Jimmy's... Here. okay. I'm here. Yes, bro. very quickly. Yeah, please just just allow us to sink into this, Ochami, by right. reading this. Yeah. Exemplary leadership. Model the way. Inspire a shared vision. Challenge the process. Enable others to act. Encourage the heart. Thank you. I cannot say it better. I cannot say it better. And every one of those constructs is too important. Amen and amen. Model the way. Don't ask others to do things you can't do. Timeliness. Present at the task. Picking the broom. Mentoring. Inspire a shared vision. Remember what vision is to us. Now we understand what a vision is all about. Challenge the process. But we have been doing this all the time. And our graduation rates are not coming up. We can't just keep crying. We, we are not graduating. Like I see headmasters go on parade. And they say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. In this school... Students don't like maths. They don't pass maths. Is that true? It is not true. The problem is not the students. The problem is you and your staff. Yeah. Why is it in maths, out of 200 students, we have 10 A's and we have 100 E's? Surely the problem cannot be the students. And when you are the leader and you are lamenting on parade, I don't know what to do. Yeah, true. So you pack up your things and leave. Hmm? Me, when I was in school, I was very bright in maths. Does that make them pass maths? You are supposed to instigate measures, model the way to get those results. You must challenge the process that is not giving you those results in your organization. And remember, somebody put it very well. It is not fighting, it's not what. 
challenging, saying we are in this together. How do we move this forward? Enable others to act. In leadership, exemplary leadership is give others space. Sometimes I normally say, give them the rope. Sometimes I throw a rope at you in your space. Oh, me, I want this. Yes, here it is. I want this. Yes. Oh, this one is not there. Here it is. But more importantly, encourage the heart. Oh, my God. Just that telling somebody, I don't know what I would do without you. So my director of quality assurance, the other day, the ministry came to audit uh, the university about uh, chapel and uh, religious practice. When we finished, by the way, we were exonerated and all those things. When we finished uh, in a meeting, when I was thanking them, I told uh, Sylvia Trigong, you have made me strong. Just look at that simple sentence. I haven't even written the recommendation letters. Encourage the heart. The five dysfunctions leaders face. This is what we have, we have just been doing, but I want to run through it very quickly. These are the five dysfunctions that leaders face. And there they are. Absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, inattention to results. Absence of trust. Listen, Othello, it simply makes no difference how good the rhetoric is, or even how good the intentions are, if there is little or no trust, there is no foundation for permanent success. What is trust? Think of two people, one you trust and the other that you don't trust. In the context of building, trust is the confidence among team members that their peers' intentions are good and that there's no reason to be careful around them. Yes. That's what trust, we have talked about trust, but now I'm telling you, is the confidence among team members that their peers' intentions are, are good. And there's no reason to be careful around them. Now, there we are. We have done that today. Now you know, and it's going to be in your, in your notes. But I want you to look at number six. Members of teams with an absence of trust. Uh, waste time and energy managing their behaviors for effect. Let me give you an example. When I, when I was the principal sunshine, uh, one of the subjects that gave us problems was Kiswahili. And the day the results came, Kiswahili had a mean of about eight points when, when the other subjects were at 11 including maths. One of the teachers of Kiswahili whose class did so badly that brought the mean down in Kiswahili, that time drove through the gate. She had an Isan saloon, but that day she came with a four-wheel Toyota Pajero. And she drove into the gate, it was parade time. We used to stand outside that, that place. And she drove and went to park her Pajero. The results had come out, we had celebrated, but people were feeling very bad about Kiswahili. Because if Kiswahili had done well, it would have been among the top two or three in the country. 
and she came dressed with very, very sharp high heels. So as we were moving to classes, she was on the corridor and you would hear the, the sound of the heels. Da, da, da. And then goes to staff room and says, me, you people can, can, can run for those means. The salary TSC pays me cannot even fuel that car. She had taken the husband's car to school. Please don't waste time and energy managing behavior for effect. Huh? Some of you, because of ethnicity, the headmaster is from Nyanza, is a Luo, you are a Luo. In the school, you are the ones giving the worst results, but you are the ones making the most noise and saying, ah, this one is ours. This one is ours. But this school is ours. You are managing behavior for effect. Old grudges we are discussed. Dread meetings we are discussed. Members who are trusting, we have already done that. The role of the leader, the role of the leader, I am emphasizing, demonstrate vulnerability. Uh, demonstrate vulnerability all the time as a leader. Uh, demonstrate vulnerability. I, I wish I could, uh, I don't have time, but I, I want everyone to learn this, that you become very good. You become the person we look upon when you demonstrate vulnerability, weakness, defenselessness, helplessness, openness, exposure, reliability. I mean, liability, sorry. This is what we mean by vulnerability. It doesn't make you weak. It makes you strong in a team context. So demonstrate vulnerability. Tell your students, you know, every time your results come, my heart sinks. Don't say, I don't care whether you fail or not. Me, I already have my degree. Uh, just a minute. So the role of the leader is to demonstrate vulnerability. Number two, the fear of conflict we have discussed. And, and just look, listen to this. This is not me. This is uh, Dostoevsky. Much happiness has come into the world because of bewilderment and things left unsaid. You are my master students and, and some of the PhD students online. Much unhappiness has come into the world because of bewilderment and things left unsaid. The fear of conflict has made the world very unhappy. <clears throat> Is conflict positive? Prof. Can we, prof. Yes. Yes. Hello, Prof. I, I was writing that yes. quote kindly. I, I was writing yeah, that quote. The role I wish you of... are... you, use your phone to take snaps very quickly. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Chris, my friend, take let me please shot for let us. Let me do that. Very good. Thank you. All Thank right. you, Prof. Yes. So um Conflict, is it positive? We have discussed that. Just note that teams that, that engage in productive conflict know that the only purpose is to produce the best possible solution in the shortest period of time. So conflict, Sio Mangumi, no, is trying to get clarity. You are in this tunnel of chaos. Teams that fear conflict, we have already done that. Waste a lot of time and energy posturing. Teams that engage in conflict, we have already said they they do all those things. Suggestions of overcoming. I like suggestions of overcoming fear of conflict. Mining, extracting buried disagreements within the team. 
and sheds the light of the day on them. Then coaching one another not to be not to retreat from healthy debate. But you know, that will only happen when we trust each other. The role of the leader demonstrate restraint, personally model appropriate conflict behavior. Lack of commitment. This is something. If I have said nothing, I want you to take this home. The lack of conflict. And I wish all of us would write this down. And this is the one. This is something I want everybody to talk about. Josephine K, are you there? Or Sami Sanya? Who is ready? I'm here, Prof. I'm here. Okay. Prof. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> Josephine, can you read that for us? The lack of commitment. The lack of commitment. Always remember the distinction between contribution and commitment. Take the matter of, uh, of bacon and eggs. The chicken makes a contribution. A pig makes a commitment. A pig. The pig. Yeah. Made a commitment. Can can Sanya, can you repeat that? Because both of you said yes. Yeah, the lack, the lack of commitment. Always remember the distinction between contribution and commitment. Take the matter of bacon and eggs. The chicken makes a contribution. The pig makes a commitment. In the context of a team, a commit, commitment is a function of two things, clarity and buy-in. Should you come to me, uh, Josephine, Kay, can you read that again? I just want to be sure we have gotten the message. Because uh, commitment is what I want from each one of you if you're going to graduate in 18 months. Go ahead. The lack of commitment. Always remember the distinction between contribution and commitment. Take the matter of bacon and eggs. The chicken makes a contribution. The pig makes a commitment. In the context of a team, commitment is a function of things. Clarity and buy in. Thank you. Prof, can I say something quickly just to confirm that I have understood what that quote is about? Please, please. Yeah, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm thinking uh, when we say that the chicken makes a contribution, what comes to my mind is that the chicken lays an egg, makes a little noise, and takes a walk. Whereas for us to have bacon, the pig has to die. Mm. Yeah. And this is not a hero, it's John Mark Keter or Carter. Please remember that. Yeah. Yeah, bro. I think it's close to what you said from the beginning, being unrealistic. Mm. Yeah. Now, look, listen to this. Enemies of commitment. Huh? The need for consensus. Lazima tukubaliani. Sometimes in the pursuit of unanimity, we seek artificial harmony, and that leads to low, low levels of commitment. Fear of failure. This is the most common reason people do not commit. They would rather not ever take a stand on something than risk being wrong. If someone if someone is not being heard or listened to, they will not invest in any decisions or goals. Mismatch. A person who is in the wrong position 
for him or her will not contain the interest or passion necessary to achieve high levels of commitment. So you must have the right fit. You must be a square peg and uh, make sure that you also get a square hole. A team that fails co to commit, we have gone through that th this evening. And a team that commits, we have also gone through that this evening. Suggestions for overcoming the lack of commitment, cascading messaging, deadlines, contingency, and low-risk exposure therapy, if you can do it. And that is commitment. The role of the leader, be comfortable with the, with the prospect of making a decision that ultimately turns out to be wrong. Constantly push the group for closure around issues and adherence to schedules the team has set. You are the ones who wanted to do leadership. It is not me. Avoidance of accountability. I liked what Boaz brought up and uh, was it Nyawiti, but avoidance of accountability. The secret of discipline is motivation. When a man is sufficiently motivated, discipline will take care of itself. So in the context of teamwork, accountability refers specifically to the willingness of the team members to call their peers on performance of behaviors that might hurt the team. And we must be disciplined enough to understand these are not personal attacks, but we want to do well. So uh, this is a self-check. Uh, I'll send you this and you can find time to go through. Uh, and I like teams that hold one another accountable. They ensure poor performers feel pressure to improve. In attention to results, work is the quintessential quality grounded in individual achievement. No, no. In attention to results. So when you don't have an attention to results, you are so embedded in individual achievement that it is a contradiction to teamwork. Eventually, the school will not excel, even if you had 100 A's in Kiswahili and the other subjects did not perform. Eventually, DESTA will not graduate people. Yes, if research methods is not taught properly. You can have as many masters and PhD students, but they will not graduate. And this is what Patrick says, the ultimate dysfunction of a team is the tendency of members to care about something other than the collective goals of the group. And I hope each one of us, this is a postgraduate class, you are taking in what you consider to be important. So I'll not go through this course of time, but you'll have the notes to, 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 to go through. But where would we like to be? This is where I would like to be. This is my mission at, at uh, our beloved Daystar. I want all of us to trust each other. I will want us to engage in the tunnel of chaos, conflict. But once we go through it, all of us submit and say, I had my day in court. At least I told them how I felt. Now we can move forward. You become commit, you, you demonstrate commitment, accountability, and you focus on results. Wow.
That's that's where we would like to be. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I have personally have enjoyed this class uh, on leadership. Um, I'm happy where we are going. We have one more model to, uh, module to go through. Uh, together with the what you're working on, Draka. And then, as usual, you know, I'm not as kind always. I'll give you a typical multiple choice uh, exam to carry the 30 marks, and then you have finished the course. See, to Simamia Apple, uh, some open discussion. Jen, Jenny, Amicia, is your hand still up or you had it up before? No, I've raised it up. I have a question. Go ahead. Based on the assignment. Jenny, just go ahead. Um, um, you're breaking. Okay. Oh, all right. I, I hope you On the assignment? Yes, I'm asking about the assignment. I know you've said uh, we highlight and annotate mm. uh, and write a, a synopsis of one page. Yeah. Draka, the social ecologist. Yes. And you had, earlier on, you had asked us to, to download and have a hard copy. So this part, mm. are we doing it on soft copy online or are we working on the hard copy? Either way, don't don't feel restricted. Eh? Either way, I, I, it has to be online for people who are outside Nairobi, but if you are within Nairobi, by the way, if you are within Nairobi, sometimes it's good just to drop in on campus. Uh, uh, some of us are too busy, but drop them in my office. I will work on it. You can pick it, whether we meet or not. Or, uh, but if you are online, you're better and the rest, uh, you know, just, just do what you're supposed to do. And what I'm going to do with this, uh, like the topics and uh, the introduction to the problem, the problem statement, the purpose and the objectives, uh, we shall scan them back to you. That's why I want to look at them before tomorrow's class. Tomorrow's class is very critical for everybody. Chris, what is that? Uh, yes, thanks, bro. Uh, mine was also in line with the assignment. Uh, mm. You gave us two assignments last time, and the other one was on the six items, if I'm not wrong. Mm. Best to be and stress and stay and calm. Prof, I was requesting that um, if possible, we submit this particular assignment for purposes of not forgetting, because now we are having a lot of assignments from different units. Yeah, and then, so you uh, sub <laughs> just submit. Uh, so I don't know if you are for the opinion that those who can be able to drop physically can drop it yeah, so that then we're able to... Just no problem, no problem. At your okay. convenience. Thank you. But what I would like to... What I would like... What I'm not giving you an option is about tomorrow. Everybody must submit to me what we are calling the concept notes of your possible area of study. It might not be. We are going to change it. You are going to change it. But tomorrow, Probably, after uh, you are gone breaking, through, prof. I don't know if it is my okay. internet. After after I've yeah, gone no, through, after I've gone through tomorrow, uh, I will then be looking at. I'll look at some topics of interest. Me, uh, my passion normally directs me where I have interest. And I'll begin to give some of you uh, reading material to begin to interrogate. And you'll find the topic will just, uh, is fluid. It, it will begin to change and change. But uh, my commitment, my promise is that uh, by the end of this semester, each one of you will have a semblance of uh, a proposal. All right, uh, there being no other worry, no question, no nothing, uh, can I leave you? I want to eat brown ugali with some fish and uh, soja. Hi, Prof. Hi, Cindy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, so this is Cindy. Uh, my question is, after you've returned the, 
the topics that we submitted. Can one resubmit a different topic altogether? Yeah, yeah, we are learning. Oh, okay. we are learning. No, no problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank any you. Other, yeah. Any other problem? Very good class. Very good students. Uh, you you really encourage my heart, and thank you for the the nice things you've said uh, and the prayers you prayed for me. Uh, so um, stay well and uh, see you tomorrow. And tomorrow will be grueling. Uh, I have many meetings, but I hope we can start at five thirty latest. So please be online five thirty because I want to see whether I can get an extra half an hour to nine o'clock. And we will have done what I want to do with those topics. Good night. Thank you and okay. good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. Good night, everybody. I end the meeting. Bye. Good night, Karen. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night. <laughs>